All right. So next up, uh, we're going to have Dr. Larry Emting. He's a neurologist in Atlanta, and he does uh, a lot of work with with brain injury patients, especially all the way from uh, NFL players to uh, workers' comp injuries and many other other types of, of brain injuries and uh, works with mold patients as well. So he has a lot of great information to share today and some of the, the different experiences he has working with those those groups. So Larry, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. All right. Thank, ben. thank you, Ben. Can you hear me here okay? We can hear you just fine and we can see the screen. Great. Perfect. Um, well, thanks for the introduction. I've been very much enjoying the entire program today. I learn something every time I hear talks that I've heard before, and then also some unique uh, aspects here. And it all fits together. I love the uh, integrative uh, style of all the different uh, types of professionals kind of bringing things here. So uh, thanks to the presenters prior to me. And I hope I can add a little bit to that as we go along. <clears throat> as Ben mentioned, uh, my background is uh, more traditional medicine. I actually trained both in psychiatry and neurology at uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. So it's fairly classic, hardcore, scientifically based um, uh, med medicine. Um, but having trained both in psych and neuro, I ended up seeing a lot of the odd and unusual cases. And for instance, my uh, chairman at the time of my residency was telling me as I'm stepping into neurology after psychiatry is that I should be comfortable with not, with not knowing about what 25 percent of my patients had because there's a lot of unknowns in neurology and brain science and I'm sure some of those cases were mold cases that I went on to see but didn't recognize um, and uh, so pulling that all together has been a, a very very helpful for me. Um, I, I came down to the southeast from uh, Baltimore uh, to Atlanta in 1994 and I started seeing cases here sent from another colleague who's an ear, nose, and throat doc, uh, Dr. Dennis. And Dr. Dennis uh, was very instrumental in pulling together some of the fungal sinusitis issues. Um, Don Dennis uh, sent, started sending me patients that had um, neurologic and neuropsychiatric uh, features and asked me uh, to uh, treat their pain problems. When I was at Hopkins, I was on the neurology faculty and I ran the pain center. So I was familiar with uh, treating pain-related issues. So Dr. Dennis, Dennis sent me those. And what was also interesting was not just the pain aspect, like headaches, migraines, myofascial joint pain, but a lot of these patients would have neurologic-like symptoms that can look alike but not actually be a full syndrome. Like they can be Parkinson's type tremors, they can have MS-like symptoms but not actually be full uh, MS. And then of course there are some patients who have say Parkinson's and then they get worse or change. So it's this uh, integrative look at these things that I've been kind of fascinated by uh, over the years. So. I'm going to uh, go over my talk here and basically look at the mold exposure. I'm going to look at some trauma-related cases, but I'm going to start out a little bit more with um, some of the mold cases because that's kind of where I started. And with that, um, I'll, I'm going to go down here to also look at the uh, acetylglutathione, resveratrol, nitric acid oxide supplements that have been really a mainstay of getting some of these patients uh, uh, much better. So with that, let me just give you a quick overview <clears throat> of the talk. I'm going to talk first about, about mold and mycotoxin cases, and then we'll go on to concussions, everything from industrial injury, motor vehicle accidents, because I have for the last 20 years been seeing uh, cases where, as, uh, as Dr. Robertson uh, uh, suggested, you have someone who has a brick ball on them from three stories up. These are my, my patients. Bubby and Rusty and head trauma has been a mainstay of seeing uh, workers' comp cases, but also motor vehicle accidents. Uh, we see some personal injury cases as well. Now, with expertise in that area, <clears throat> the NFL and the uh, attorneys with the NFL uh, uh, players started sending me patients for independent medical evaluations um, in, in looking at a bigger settlement issue. So I started seeing about 10, 15 of those um, uh, pro players, retired pro players as well. And of course, with they had concern about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And all of, all of these guys, and I'll give you an example or two, 
all of them had some degree of memory cognition and neuropsychiatric features. And then we'll go on down here to the uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, paradigms here and then also go through the conclusion then. So this is where we're going to start. <clears throat> this is a case of mine, a uh, 50-year-old female. She's a very bright gal, very well organized, very perfectionistic, a graphic designer. She had a, a mold exposure in her home in 2004. That was her first exposure. She tried all kinds of different supplements, including uh, over-the-counter uh, glutathione and other things, was not getting better. Um, then she went on and also had some sinus work done, cleaning out the sinuses with the, uh, the antifungals and so forth, and that helped somewhat, but not as much as you would like. I didn't see her till 2012, and she still, at that point, was having memory problems, uh, short-term memory in particular, cognitive issues, particularly um, executive uh, uh, aspects, uh, things that would involve uh, her work as a graphic designer to the point that she could not function any longer, and she also had balance issues. And these would wax and wane, and when you take her history, they would wax and wane according to her exposure. She'd go into a supermarket that had, say, a a vegetable section that clearly had some contamination and she'll get thrown away off to the point she couldn't even shop any further. She would have these episodes when her home got re-exposed uh, uh, or more water uh, damage came in, uh, she would get re-exposed with that. So <clears throat> here's an example of a classic uh, MRI. This is this patient we're talking about. And I'm going to kind of walk through and describe uh, the different uh, parts of the brain here. This is basically, over on the left side of the screen, a slice through the middle of the brain. You top, take a slice from the top and work your all, all the way down. This is about halfway down. The front of the patient's skull is up here and the back is back here. The things of interest here would include the outer coating of the brain, and this is the cortex, and if you actually cut brains, it's gray, so that's the gray matter. So that's the cortex, and you can see it undulates up and down. That way we get more cortex um, surface, uh, they say, for instance, than uh, lower animals, for instance. Now the dark here, actually, if you cut the brain, is white, white matter, and the white matter uh, becomes white because it has this coating or this insulation called myelin. And you can imagine that if you have one area like these are the frontal lobes here and they connect back to other areas like the verbal areas or the um, mathematic areas and the visual areas are, are here, there are fiber tracks that run front to back, side to side, and up and down, which would be in and out of the screen. So here we have uh, a case that uh, she's 50 and you can see these uh, nicely myelinated dark fibers here. What you can also see, interestingly enough, is these little spots. These should also be dark. So these would be small areas of increased uh, signal, which indicate that there's some uh, loss of the cellular structure, some of the myelin is lost at that, at that spot. We would call this a subcortical site because it's at the cortex but just below it. There's a lot of small blood vessels in that area. But with her, we can see a little one here, for instance. We can see a little one over here. And if you go through her scan top to bottom, you can see these scattered throughout. Uh, the frontal area is just an easier, better area to take a look at it with. Now, if we go over to this um, view over here, this is slices coming from top to bottom, front to back. So this would be the frontal lobe. It would be a cut right across right through here, and this spot here, for instance, you can actually see it over here. So we have um, these spots that are interrupting some of the uh, fiber tracks go from one part of the brain to another. And here, of course, we can also see side-to-side -side communications. So <clears throat> we will see this with um, inflammatory changes of the brain of various types, but you'll see this not infrequently with mold-related cases that have some inflammatory processes, particularly if the blood vessels are involved. Um, so let's go to the next slide here. So, so when we had this patient who had done everything that she could through standard medical uh, treatments, um, we basically took and worked with her on the environmental 
uh, aspects. Uh, the fogs are home and had uh, this detailed, constant, and vigilant um, activity, and she's really very much a perfectionist. So she was able to do all these things despite being a little bit disorganized. So as we're treating her, she'd have a little water uh, uh, intrusion here, a little water intrusion there, and so she'd have these symptoms, her symptoms recurring anytime she had a mold reinfestation. But she kept after it, worked very hard, and that was a major help for her. Now, if she went out, she got in her car, she went to a store. Uh, you know, we all know if we go into certain areas in uh, retail businesses that might be uh, mold-related areas, carpet or what have you, she would get thrown off with her balance or thinking. All that stuff would immediately come back. So we worked on our environment, and then we also started her on the supplements that we've been discussing here uh, from Citrusafe, the acetyl glutathione, there was Veritrol, and to get the uh, nitrous oxide, at that point, uh, the meat powder rather than the uh, pine bark. And with those, and with time, she had a slow, steady improvement. And keep in mind, keep in mind that this is a gal who was exposed in 2004 initially, fluctuant symptoms for years, and then cleaned up her environment, uh, uh, took the supplements, and she had slow, steady improvement to the point that she was able to go back, uh, uh, get a new job, um, start taking her fam care of her family the way she did before. So here's a nice case of go this going on for quite a while, clear lesions in the brain, but you might notice that there were not a lot of lesions in the brain just a few here and there, which means this is a functional ongoing process where she was impaired as opposed to permanent uh, damage. What we do see, however, in some patients, for instance, this is a case of someone who was exposed similarly between 2005 and 2007. <clears throat> some people, if they're more susceptible or more vulnerable, uh, go from that delirium, or some people will call it a brain fog, but it's really basically a delirium where the uh, patient will have confusion, a little bit like being drunk, and they'll get impaired temporarily, and then they get back to normal. Our first patient got back to almost, uh, almost uh, normal, maybe not 100 percent, but close to it. So here's a brain scan for her, 2005, and you can see this generally looks pretty good. Um, you can see the white matter tracks, you can see the, uh, the cortex, and we call the uh, little bumps here, gyri, and a little uh, indentation sulci. And you can see that, they're, that they go out pretty much to the edge here, edge of the skull area. But what you can see are there's small white spots here, and those are areas that are not abnormal. They're increased um, um, uh, uh, signal. Now, years ago, they used to call these UBOs, uh, unidentified bright objects, but as we're understanding more and more with functional tests and so forth and uh, PET scans and so forth, we're understanding that these are not normal and like inflammatory processes, in this case, mold can kick it off. So now we go nine <coughs> years ahead and look at our brain MRI. So we're starting to see more white, which is spinal fluid around the front and along the side. We're starting to see more deeper, wider sulci and the gyri getting a little bit smaller. So this is the, the, the imaging of um, dementia. So what's happened over the years is that it's gone from, for instance, our first patient who had functional impairment that would come and go with exposure to this patient who continued to have exposures and um, wasn't uh, getting uh, the treatment and probably had a more susceptible uh, brain. Uh, for instance, this might have been an ApoE4 uh, carrier, for instance. This patient went from delirium to actual depression. So by the time we saw her, she had a moderate depression. You can see all these spots all the way along here. And so basically this cortical atrophy. Um, and that would be, in some uh, areas, called pre dementia. Uh, as opposed to dementia per se. Here's a recent uh, case uh, that we've seen, and this just gives you an idea of the uh, variability uh, within uh, genetics of a family. So we've got a family that came to, s to see us not too long ago, and this family was exposed with a sewage um, exposure within their a rental home that they had, and they had this exposure for about four months, but it was pretty intense. 
and um, mother got the worst of it. She was at home the most. Uh, father was a professional, in, uh, not at home as much, and the daughter uh, was not altogether at the home as much either. So um, all three of them were getting ill. I saw them, I guess this would be 2000, end of 2015, early 2016, <clears throat> and I got to see all of these uh, uh, these cases, and uh, Dad just had a mild cognitive impairment. We we're doing full battery neurocognitive testing on them, uh, and um, his his wife uh, was severely impaired. Uh, she's a bright gal who had some uh, reserve, but still was uh, quite impaired. And then we had the daughter who uh, was moderately uh, impaired, got a younger brain, and a bright gal there as well. Now <clears throat> when we looked at their uh, APOE4 status, we can see um, on this um, study we have the, she has a 3 slash 3 uh, subset. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, this is father who did pretty pretty well with this. So he had a lesser exposure and he had uh, genes that seemed to be kind of helping him, although he noticed both at work and his wife actually would notice his cognitive stuff at home uh, as well. Now the wife, um, who was not doing that well, who was the worst of the three, um, she has a uh, three slash four. So she's a carrier here and she definitely is not doing better. And they were all out of this after four months. So four months of intense exposure and then they're out of it. But here's, here's someone who has the, uh, as, as Dr. Roberts points out, the uh, less capable and in fact, um, you know, enzyme going awry and not cleaning up and, and, and not doing correctly, he, uh, she has this uh, risk factor here for the APOE4. So we know we're going to have to do a whole lot more for her than we are going to have to do uh, for her husband. Now the daughter um, had this exact same uh, APOE34. So again, this is a young gal moving out of home who wants to be living on her own. Uh, is going to have a tough time doing that. So these, both of these two, need to have their environment cleaned up. Um, they're going to be, we're going to need to have them on. They're from out of state, so we're going to try to find a um, clear mind representative near home uh, for them. And um, they actually uh, sought after Pingree as part of their uh, uh, circulation here uh, in, in, in working up their case. So <clears throat> they're going to need a, a lot of uh, different inputs. Um, now let's go on from that. That's one type of uh, insult, and I think uh, Dr. Roberts uh, is correct, uh, and Dr. Galliard is correct, that almost any type of insult can give you a similar sort of problem. So in this case, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, concussions. <clears throat> now I see a lot of work-related injuries, and what's been interesting over the years is that in the same day sometimes you might see someone who has a head impact just like your next patient, but one patient does very poorly and they seem to have an acquired brain injury after a concussion and another might have nothing at all. They fall off a three-story building, hit their head, uh, get knocked out, and they're doing pretty pretty good after you know the initial workup and the interventions. Whereas someone who um, has a similar injury uh, is actually doing quite poorly. They're just not making any recovery and those people uh, probably have the different uh, genetics. Uh, we also see uh, patients that have car wrecks, uh, personal injury cases, uh, some uh, falls, again with concussions, mostly looking at concussive issues here. We see a lot of these folks of course have post-traumatic uh, migraines, um, but almost all of them have some degree of memory, cognition, and um, neuropsychiatric changes. Now, <clears throat> in the last few years here, we've been seeing some uh, patients that are high school sports uh, guys, but uh, more so we're seeing the NFL players. First of all, with the, uh, the study, I'm sorry, with the uh, lawsuit uh, with the NFL, and um, these were uh, patients referred by their attorneys to get a good handle on kind of where their status was currently. All of them have a real concern about going on to have chronic traumatic encephalopathy and of course some of our pro players have committed suicide, donated their brain, so they're all very cognizant of the possible downside of this business. So let's talk a little bit sort of uh, schematically 
uh, breaking down the concussions uh, themselves. So here uh, we just have uh, sort of a uh, translucent uh, skull and skin, and we have the brain here. Here's the frontal lobes, temporal lobes, and this comes down into the, into the lower brain stem and goes down into the spinal cord. And what happens <clears throat> if we get an external impact, you know, whether it's a car wreck or a brick falling, uh, that uh, impact hits uh, the scalp and the skull, and it impacts uh, uh, the, uh, that surface area, and that some of that force gets transmitted into the brain itself. So here is where the, the brain is going to take some of its biggest hit, as it were, and the French used to call that coup, and the other side of the uh, injury is the contra coup, or we'll see towards the the back side of the brain. So you get an impact and it drives the head back. And when you drive the head back, the brain with this inertia falls forward. So not only the direct imp impact of the force, but also the brain dr getting driven forward uh, smacks itself on the front of the inside of the uh, skull. So this, this area, the coup area, usually takes a, a double hit, as it were. But uh, then um, as it slaps forward, then the brain slaps backwards, so you have a contra coup. So coup and contra coup is basically uh, where it was hidden initially, and then the brain slaps back towards the other side because the brain is a mushy. It's not mushy, really. It has a firm consistency, but it's not a solid organ, so it'll slap back here, and you can get bruises here on the opposite side, oftentimes, of the, uh, of the skull. And of course, if you have twisting motions, other areas that are more sensitive, like the brain stem, for instance, or the temporal lobes, can also be injured. So then, whoops, sorry. So one thing that's interesting is kind of to keep track of the vector forces, that is, of the forces put in here, delivered, contra coup over here, you have a good idea of some of the uh, force uh, angulation as it goes through the brain. You can try to correlate that with neuropsychological and with imaging studies. So here, <clears throat> we're going to go back to some imaging studies. Now this is a CAT scan instead of an MRI. CAT scan uses x-rays to look at uh, different parts of the brain, and if you have a head bump or concussion or a car wreck, you're going to go into the ER, and they're going to do this. Um, a CT is easier to do, and a CT um, looks mostly for acute blood. Uh, for instance, here's an area here that has an increased signal. This is bone or calcium, but this is increased uh, density here, so there's probably some blood in between the one hemisphere and the other hemisphere. You see it in the back, and you see it up front here as well. But what you also see is where the impact was. Uh, right here, um, uh, there's an area that has little areas of increased density. That's blood. So there's a little bit of blood there, a little bit of blood here. This is swelling, so it has less intensity. So this would be uh, someone who got hit from the, uh, um, the right side. Uh, on these scans, right's left and left's right, but the pot bottom line is, is the impact was from this side, and you get this uh, area through here, the brain is bruised. And it's just like if you pop a muscle on the surface, it's going to get black and blue as it were, you're going to see a little blood deposition here, but of course compared to say muscle, like in your leg or your arm, the brain does not uh, do as well with that, and it's not able to repair itself as well. Now, uh, this is a case where we have <clears throat> the impact was up front, a little bit lower than this, but here on the back side of the brain, and this would be frontal, uh, parietal, and this is getting back to more posterior parietal, not quite occipital. Here's an area that has an in increased signal that's on the contra coup. The impact was up here, and the contra coup is in the back, uh, back here. And of course, you can imagine that if the force is delivered up front, and you have this injury back here, you get all those structures, those uh, uh, communicating structures from front to back that can be uh, damaged and, and, and structures that go from side to side that can also be injured. This is one of the newer um, imaging uh, techniques. <clears throat> it's called diffusion tensor imaging. And basically what it does is it takes a picture for instance, at one part of the brain, and then uh, just moments later, it'll uh, follow that imaging with the water molecules 
down a fiber tract. So this diffusion tensor imaging is a methodology for looking at uh, not like so much at the surface, it's looking at the fiber tracks. And in this <coughs> particular uh, style of presentation, the green are the fiber tracks from front to back, kind of red and yellow are from side to side, and then the blue ones are the ones coming in and out of the screen that are going up and down. So this is again a similar slice to CT and MRI, and you can kind of compare that to those studies. Now here's a, <coughs> a, a DTI with an injured brain. And they have shown us here in this little uh, cubicle here, uh, that's the normal side of the brain. And you see it's missing over here. We should have some red fibers uh, being shown. And that's, again, going from left to right. So coming from the cortex, in this case, the parietal cortex, and going uh, towards uh, this part of the, uh, this part of the uh, 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 crossing fibers or corpus callosum over here. We're missing that, and you might be able to convince yourself there's missing maybe a little bit more along this whole area here, because this is the most obvious, but there seems to be some changes there as well. Um, if we take a look at someone who's had an uh, older injury, this is the MRI. I'm sorry, this is actually a CT. Uh, my, my apologies, it's mislabeled. This is a CT bony skull up here, that area there is completely filled with fluid because the brain has died. This brain had a contusion in that area and there was uh, bleeding and finally absorption of the uh, bad tissue, uh, disease, disease tissue, and the, the, this is what's left behind. It should look like this side, but you can see it's a little bit bigger here. And I think you might be able to convince yourself also you see on the other side where the everything's pretty smooth and right up to the skull here. Over here, we can see the lines are a little bit more prominent. So he probably has some atrophy there as well. So we, if we take an MRI of the CT over here, we can see this side seems to be pretty well intact. The area that we have here is less prominent here. You see all these uh, fibers coming from front to back, front to back. They're not over here. So this is that whole area that doesn't show up that well. And this is more of a functional uh, testing. So this whole area here, you can see, I think it's easier to convince yourself that there's there's some decrease here compared to over here and some decrease here compared to over here. So here's someone who had a focal impact. But there's clearly uh, some involvement of more of the uh, 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 hemisphere uh, there as well. <laughs> So let's take a few examples. This is a case of a 52-year-old uh, woman, female executive, very bright, uh, pre-morbid IQ, probably 130, 140. And uh, she has a particular talent for being able to visually uh, analyze uh, spreadsheets. This is really her big talent and led her to a very prominent position in her executive uh, situation at her corporate setting. So. She was uh, in the restroom at work, and she slipped and fell because there was water on the floor. And she, her head went down, and it hit the marble uh, in the right uh, uh, brow area, to a lesser degree the face. And uh, she didn't get knocked out, but she was dazed, bleeding in that area, and basically just kind of popped up, wanted to keep going, um, rather than getting some uh, medical care. Uh, but she had some residuals. Uh, from that, <clears throat> these are these are her signs and symptoms, um, and she had numbness in the right brow, which is that trigeminal nerve which goes up from the brow up into the top of the scalp. So she damaged that nerve locally. She had headaches, which are classic post-traumatic migraines: throbbing, pounding. She got nauseous, got vomiting. Bright lights bothered her. Um, uh, loud noises bothered her, and her memory was off particularly short term, but also her special talent, the cognitive aspect, her analytical abilities uh, went away. She was not able to do those, look at the spreadsheet and predict the trend that her uh, corporation needed her to do. Now she was very invested in staying there, so she kept on working. Her team helped her with a lot of this. She was more irritable, somewhat depressed, her neurocognitive testing uh, was off, um, and we basically 
would say that she has a post-concussive syndrome. It involves a lot of these things, including other things like balance, vestibular function, and so forth. So she had classic post-concussive syndrome as part of her uh, clinical presentation. Uh, when we saw her initially, we did a screening. Her balance was off, although she didn't think her balance was that off, and it clearly was. Her reaction time was slowed, and uh, these two tests are subtests that we took from, uh, uh, borrowed from Kay Kilborn's um, um, sequence, uh, uh, test battery. Uh, he did uh, many uh, uh, wonderful environmental exposure issues, was involved in American Academy of Environmental Medicine and other groups, but he's passed away recently. But at any rate, these two were off. Uh, she wouldn't have expected them to be off, wouldn't have really given us a history that they'd be off. Her MRI with the diffusion tensor imaging was abnormal. She had uh, an area that went from the right frontal lobe uh, to the right temporal lobe. And this is called the arcuate fasciculus. This is the communication between frontal and temporal area on the right side of the brain. So that area of the brain, uh, frontal to temporal, um, probably had a lot to do with her losing her numerical um, um, arithmetic uh, type of uh, uh, abilities. Her actual overall uh, neuropsych IQ, even though certain areas were off more than others, went from 130 pre-morbid estimate to uh, 115. So she dropped 15 IQ points with this uh, one impact, even without losing consciousness. They oftentimes make a big deal about losing consciousness, but you don't have to lose consciousness to have con concussion without uh, loss of consciousness and have significant pathology. So what we did with her was we uh, put her on the supplements, the uh, acetylglutathione, which is the veritrol, and the beet powder uh, nitrous oxide supplementation. And sure enough, her cognition improved, her mood and affect improved, and her judgment and insight improved. Um, it was a little tough to treat her because she continued working and traveling for her executive job with her team's support. Um, but nonetheless, even in the midst of that, where we're taxing her brain a little bit, uh, she still was getting better. However, her short-term memory in particular and her analytic ability, her talent, her uh, spe special uh, talent for reading spreadsheets and pulling out trends was not there uh, a full 10 months out at this point uh, from when uh, we first started the supplementation. So some, some things improved, some things did not. And certainly that uh, arcuate fasciculus um, DTI abnormality would be not inconsistent with some memory function from temporal and some analytic ability from frontal and temporal connections. So uh, she's got better, but uh, not back to normal by any means. Um, here's another case. Um, a young man um, is a 26-year-old uh, uh, firefighter, terrific shape, bright guy, and <clears throat> it was a pickup truck versus armored uh, 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 truck uh, accident. The armored truck pulled out in front of his pickup. He's going probably 45, 50 miles an hour down the road. This pulled out and he, he T-boned uh, the armored truck. And uh, the impact was pretty good. It actually tipped the armored truck over on its side, which is a pretty impressive uh, process. But he lost uh, consciousness. He had both retrograde and retrograde amnesia. And he was in the ICU for three days uh, with some uh, observation for brain swelling. And he had what we call subarachnoid hemorrhage, that is, the blood in and around the surface of the brain, in between the hemispheres of the brain. And he also bruised his left temporal and his right uh, frontal uh, areas. And uh, we don't know because of the... Uh, you know, there's no details as far as what part of his head hit first and so forth, but very clearly, both on the right and left side of his brain, he had impaired areas. So his symptoms, not too dissimilar from our uh, prior patient, included the post-traumatic migraines. Uh, he had decreased memory, particularly short-term. He had decreased cognition. And he was very irritable, very depressed, very unlike him personality-wise, if you ask the family. Um, he could not do simple financial calculations any longer. And of course, he looked like someone from the uh, uh, fireman's, um, looked like someone from the fireman's uh, uh, ca uh, calendar 
just a, a very well put together, handsome, bright, well in shape uh, guy who uh, didn't look like there's anything wrong with them if you just talk with them on a superficial basis. But if you dig for these symptoms and you do neuropsych testing, you will see clear abnormalities. Uh, so <clears throat> when we saw him, the car wreck was uh, 10 4 15. We saw him within two months. This, is, this should be two months, uh, as opposed to 10 months. We saw him two months out, so we're getting him relatively early for these type of workers, for these type of personal injury cases. Um, he has significant, with the supplements, he has significant decrease in his migraines, he had improved memory, improved cognition, and his neuropsych component was better as well. So this all improved uh, despite the fact that he had uh, trauma to uh, couple areas in his brain uh, with clear bruising contusions. So, and this, this is a young guy not interested in medication for migraines or anything else who in the end uh, basically um, just on the supplements got 80% uh, back uh, uh, to normal. We're still following him along uh, because we're particularly interested in see how, see, seeing how he does. So just with the uh, brain repair kit, as it were, with the CitraSafe uh, package, the glutathione, the Zveratrol, and the, uh, 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 the red beet uh, powder, uh, he got about 80% better, which is, I think, mainly because uh, we got to him uh, relatively early. So let's take this to, ne to the next step and get towards uh, our NFL uh, group here. So if you have a um, not just one, uh, force vector, but you have several. For instance, you've got one here to here, you got one here to here, you got one here to here. So here's, let's say we have four impact areas, and if you take a look at some of the, uh, you know, they put little recorders in some of these helmets to re really measure it, and you'll see these pictures where these are all the impacts these guys are taking. Red being more of a, a higher impact, lower yellow being a lesser impact. So you can see where these guys uh, over this is like over a week's time. That's just a week's time. You can see how many impacts that they're getting uh, to their brain. And of course, you can see the brain underneath here, underneath the helmet. Um, so, whether it's a, a concussion or inflammatory process like mold, uh, we like to think about the different constituents of the brain. So, in this case, this is a little representation of the uh, neuron, and the neuron is really the uh, the real main cell that does all the thinking and data transport and so forth. So you have this nice little cell right here. It's got all these little branches called dendrites. Here's the nucleus. And then we have what's called an axon, which is, takes information from here and transmit it, transmits it to the next nerve over here. These little swellings here are myelin. That is an insulation in and around uh, the uh, axon itself, which helps it conduct information quickly. So this is this is a cell that we want to protect, and it's what all the other cells tend to support. The blood supply coming up to the brain would include um, these uh, arteries right through here. Here's the back of the brain, the vertebral system. Here's the uh, uh, carotid system that comes up towards the front here. So. The brain is richly uh, endowed with blood vessels, and um, uh, that brings uh, nutrients and oxygen up to the uh, brain cells itself. This ugly look at um, gnarly kind of uh, cell here is an astro astrocyte. It's kind of the hero here because this astrocyte is basically the main cell, uh, and there's others, of course, but this is the main cell that supports the neuron because, for instance, most of the neurons do not get nutrients directly from the blood vessel. They have to go through a neuron. So if we look at that schematically, this is our little functional unit here. So we've got a blood vessel coming up through here, going all the way around, shooting up through there, and then um, you can see here's the astrocyte over here. It takes nutrients, and also, of course, it takes toxic uh, substances or or um, metabolic uh, uh, byproducts and gets it over to the blood uh, vessel itself. Of course, this is the area that we have the blood-brain barrier at. So, uh, so let's say nutritional uh, uh, constituents go in here, over to the cell body, and then get delivered over to the neuron. This is a neuron down here. 
and here's the myelin. And you can see the astrocyte is kind of tending to this, as it were. But you have to keep in mind that if you bruise a brain, you're gonna you can bruise blood vessels, you can bruise astrocytes and all the other cell, cells, and you can bruise neurons. So all three of these can be disrupted. Uh, so when they talk about brain cells, there's plenty besides the thinking cells, the neurons, that can get damaged. And for instance, uh, glutathione's uh, produced in the astrocyte, as well as the neuron, for instance. You need, you need glutathione in both. So what happens then, <clears throat> if we have a concussion, or any other insult to the brain, but concussion is we bruise some of these areas and we get over here and we can see how the neuron itself, it can get swollen, some of its connections get disrupted, and this is a nice little picture down through here where the transportation um, structure, little skeleton make it made up of microtubules gets destroyed and you end up getting these clumps of, we call it the tau particles, and it's part of what uh, is the uh, breakdown products of a, a cell that's injured, whether it's a neuron or astrocyte. And of course, as uh, Dr. Roberts mentioned, this goes on to de develop amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's and amyloid deposition along with tau sometimes with concussions. So we can see on a, on a big, big level getting down to a microscopic level. And of course, they're investigating these and trying to figure out uh, uh, what, what can be done uh, with those going from a healthy state to an injured state. And the um, question is, how can a brain repair itself? Because obviously, if it's damaged badly, like our gal who fell and hit her head, and the arcuofasciculus was damaged to the point it's not going to repair itself. But there are other areas that are repairing themselves and doing better. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, do as best as we can with these uh, uh, different components of the brain. Um, so. The, our football players, of course, are very concerned about this. And if you get multiple c concussions, you can have what's called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or the shortened form, the acronym is CTE. And of course, we knew about this sort of brain change decades ago um, with boxers. And the boxers uh, would have what they called dementia pugilistica, that is the mention dementia of the boxers. So basically, it's all these uh, chronic traumatic multiple concussions getting knocked out, um, and they'd have a, a brain similar to some, some that we see with, um, with football players. This is, uh, we're going to kind of stage the chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy, or this is the neuropathologic sta uh, uh, staging. These are actual uh, slices of brain, uh, front, middle, a little bit more towards the back here. And what we see in stage one, where the player or the uh, person who got a concussion is really not uh, showing too much abnormality, but you can still see little changes, like little areas like this that are stained darker. These are tau uh, 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 accumulations. And you can see one up here, you go back, and it goes a little bit deeper here. You might be seeing some down in the temporal lobe down here. This is parietal coming down into temporal. This is getting more up to frontal. So you can start seeing changes, even though clinically you might not uh, see anything. Now in stage two, we start getting some neuropsychiatric features, particularly rather than focal neurologic symptoms. We can see rage, impulsivity, depression. And a lot of that happens because we're altering uh, a lot in the frontal lobe. This is frontal, a little bit further back, a little bit further back. So what we can see here is that not, not just that little dot, you see that's bigger. We have multiple different areas subcortically that are changing here and here. Some deeper um, subcortical white matter changes. So some of the regulation from the frontal lobe, emotional control, uh, going back to other areas of the, of the brain, is getting um, damaged, and that's why we're seeing these symptoms, and oftentimes the neuropsychiatric symptoms will precede some of the other uh, components uh, that are uh, then less obvious uh, initially. Then we start getting things that the family starts noting, they're confused, they have memory loss, and part of that has to do with the temporal lobe. If we start up, this is up front, further back, further back, in the brain, front to back, so here's the frontal lobe up here, and there's some 
changes up here as well. But now we're starting to see these are the temporal lobes that have a lot, which have a lot to do with memory. Go a little bit further back, we start seeing areas where the hippocampus and the amygdala are. You can see that they are bruised. And these uh, areas on, on the middle part or medial part of the temporal lobes, so called mesial temporal areas, they take a battering particularly because there's a bone down here. And if the brain is twisted and turns, it gets bruised repeatedly. So that's why we start seeing more memory changes down here in the hippocampus area in the temporal lobe. So we're starting to see some of these other uh, aspects, emotional memory aspects. And uh, then if we go on, this is stage four. And at this point, they have uh, advanced dementia affecting a lot of things. So for instance, again, in this case, we have uh, the temporal lobes down through here. This is front, middle, and back. The temporal lobes are really uh, getting chewed up. They're small, they're shriveled. So this is the recent memory center in particular. And as that uh, goes away, sometimes they lose that emotionality. Uh, they actually become um, sort of unresponsive. And you can see up through here, look at on this entire cortex. So once you've bruised and damaged and the blood-brain barriers open up, it sort of lets this cascade keep on going. And of course, if they have a um, uh, APOE4 uh, component, uh, this is going to be a lot worse than if someone who has a 2-2 two -two or 2-3 two -three or 3-3 three -three compared to 3-4 or 4-4. Uh, um, you might expect, of course, pro athletes are probably going to be more towards that 2-2 uh, two -two and 2-3 two area because it would be hard for them to get this far with, uh, with a 3-4 and a 4-4, but I suspect we'll eventually find some as we're looking at this a little bit closer. So I started seeing the NFL concussion guys. And these are guys that are retired between the 20s and 60s. They play various positions, you know, linemen, receivers, uh, the so-called skilled positions. These guys are guys are moving fast uh, and connecting hard and they'll tell you, you know, I maybe had one or two concussions over my career, but if you uh, talk about getting their bell rung, basically this is a concussion with a loss of consciousness and they've been given the smelling salts, a lot of these guys have between 60 and 100 uh, concussions over their pro career. For instance, if they have their bell rung, um, and this is a cultural issue and a personal issue because someone's right there to take your job if you're out. If you go out for one one down or a series of down, then you're right back in there. And these are tough guys. They're not supposed to be able to. They're supposed to be able to take the punishments as part of the part of it. Uh, and, and the competition for positions is tough. So these are guys. They're not. They're not going to say much about this. Uh, even with the uh, CTE uh, business now in the press, they're still. Um, not talking much about this because this is their job, this is their life, this is their financial uh, security. So here's a case of a uh, uh, of a uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is the general outline here. So when I'm taking the history from from these guys, I'm going clear back to elementary school because these guys are playing hard and fast, you know, in their preteen era. Pre preteen uh, times. They don't too often get uh, concussions here, but occasionally they will. Uh, down at high school, uh, they will sometimes uh, uh, have a few concussions here. In college, maybe a few more, but oftentimes not too often. These are the guys that are bigger, faster, and um, quicker uh, than um, than their co colleagues, so they probably get fewer concussions unless they collide at a high rate of speed with their head, for instance. You get to the pro career, everyone's big, everyone's fast, and uh, they, they're going at a high rate of speed, 20 mile, 25 miles an hour times two, impacting with the defensive back, and they're going to get some significant um, concussions. However, having said that, true loss of consciousness, you know, like uh, on, on the McGuire film where they the player was knocked unconscious, uh, keep it uh, junior, uh, Junior in the in the end zone. This is uh, this is still fairly rare. The other thing, though, however, is the interior line, the defense, and the uh, and the uh, off offense and defense. They're basically boxing. Before they're far off their line, they're smacking the other guy in the head, and uh, 
they can get as many, if not more, concussions than the guys that are in the skilled positions. So what we do is we try to add up bell lung versus major concussions and go through the number and severity all goes to kind of keep track of them. So what we're seeing with these guys then, memory, cognition, neuropsych, they all, all, all the players that I saw had this. Even the young guys, uh, they're less likely to admit it, but uh, we asked them, you know, what they relate to us. But then I asked them, well, what would your spouse say as far as these issues? And then we start getting some information there that things are not 100% uh, as the player might represent. You know, they're young, uh, uh, still with macho guys that really don't want to admit to any weaknesses. And then I actually interview the spouse, and you get even more uh, better data about how these things are off and the progression. If you've had a spouse that stayed with this player for a number of years, you get even better information. So as, as an example, this is a case that I saw from the um, uh, NFL uh, suit uh, litigation. 64, uh, had, a, uh, had a, about a six-year pro career. Um, he would have uh, dazed, bell rung, sea stars kind of episodes, use smelling sauce. If you add these up, it's between 60 and 80 concussions uh, during his career, which is amazing uh, that they've done uh, so well with that. And he was doing pretty well, he felt, until 45, 50, and they started developing headaches. Memory was starting to go down a little bit, became more irritable and depressed to the point he almost was suicidal. They gave him some antidepressants, and sure enough, it did help, uh, but it didn't change some of the baseline aspects. And then over the last 15 years, all of this stuff uh, was steadily worsening. And this is a guy who is um, very healthy, juicing, exercising vigorously every day, doing everything he can to keep himself in the best shape, yet he's still progressing. Um, so if we ask the uh, player and the spouse, they both say he's got short-term memory uh, changes, decreased energy, he's got post-traumatic migraines that are chronic, um, takes over the counter medication. He's still running his company, and he's starting to notice cognitive issues to the point that he's not able to run it as well, needs more help doing so, and he has increased irritability, more depression, and actual personality changes. For instance, someone who might have been a happy-go-lucky, positive kind of guy becomes more pessimistic, nihilistic, you'll see, you'll hear that quite often, and that was the case here. Now the assets, in this case and others, is here's a guy with exceptional genes and constitution. He was well-educated, uh, went through uh, business, and, and ended up uh, running the, uh, his own company, uh, and he had extensive nutritional and exercise uh, habits, and he was uh, constantly getting positive input to boost up his um, a cognitive reserve, some business and life. He's he's a real motivator. Despite all that, you've uh, you've uh, you still got this uh, profile. So, what was interesting in his case is that we put him on a, a acetyl a citrus a acetyl glutathione, the resveratrol, and the beet powder, and within two months, he had a stunning improvement. And uh, both he and his wife noted the difference. He was. When he came in, he said he was 64, feeling like 74 or 84, and now he was feeling like he was 35, and his spouse clearly noted, and of course, like with all of us, you're going to get better, and then you're going to see, well, how do I do without the supplements? His spouse, within five to seven days, could definitely notice that he was off, and she would ask him spontaneously, do you want your supplements? And sure enough, he goes back and he kind of renormalizes again. But it does tell you that maintenance of those uh, supplements is important. So uh, he felt that he's more physically, mentally, and emotionally uh, back to normal for him, for his age. And uh, uh, testing him, of course, he did, did, does have some neurocognitive deficits, but you would expect him to have a. We, 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 have, we have not seen him for a little bit, so we haven't tested, tested his APOE. Uh, uh, profile, but I would bet you he's probably a 2-2, two, 2-3. Two, two, um, so if you go to the uh, traditional medical symposiums, they're going to tell you the therapy for concussion is rest, both the body and mind, and then to do some intellectual practicing um, games and so forth. Uh, in the clinical world, if these guys happen to go to uh, a 
in Doclex uh, neurology, for instance. They'll give them Alzheimer's medications. If they go to psychiatry, they'll give them some psychoactive medications. These don't tend to help at all. Uh, these can help with depression, mood, anxiety, things like that, but it doesn't help uh, uh, improve the, the brain itself. And of course, there's a lot of media marketing for brain builders with all kinds of supplements, all kinds of uh, different uh, 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 interventions. The key is to figure out which ones actually do help. Um, and um, in this case, just being someone who has no vested interest in, in any of the supplement, supplements or any of the other modalities, um, I see patients, for instance, with mold or other toxicities or concussions that have been on all kinds of different supplements and they have not worked. And of course, I'm going to see ones that uh, are not getting better. But if we take a look for, uh, at why these might work better than other uh, products, We've got the acetylglutathione resveratrol and the nitric uh, beet powder, and we've got the pine bark uh, uh, supplement uh, as well as that uh, now also. So one of the main main things here, and then uh, uh, Mr. Hayers can delineate these a little bit more. Glutathione is a mo molecule that's produced within the uh, cells, including brain cells, but it's also something that we're trying to get to the brain to help them run and sustain itself and repair itself. So this is the regular molecule, and if you were to try to get this from the blood into the brain, it's got to split it to transport each um, part of the molecule into the brain and then put it back together. So it's a fairly inefficient uh, process, and um, most of the time, this glutathione, if you take it orally, doesn't get up, it doesn't get to the brain because it gets destroyed in the gut. Now, if you take this molecule, and again, uh, Walter can uh, go over this a little bit more, and you uh, uh, look at all its functions here, the antioxidant synthesis, protein synthesis, all the things that run and help the, the brain repair itself, and you look at all the tough trouble you have here getting this molecule into the brain, it has low oral activity it has, in this form. It doesn't get absorbed very well in this form. It has a short, blood, uh, short lifespan in the bloodstream. So you can take a ton of over-the-counter, um, off-the-shelf, um, you know, manufactured glutathione, just doesn't get there. And then oftentimes it's un unprotected, doesn't get into the cell properly. So if you take this, and then and again Walter can explain this a little bit better than I, being, being the pharmacist, and the, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the person with a bit of biochemical information, you take it and you acetylate it, it changes the shape. So this can get into the brain uh, without being torn down into two, piece, two pieces, and so it's much more efficient. And if you take this molecule and you put a coating on it, a nanotechnology coating on it, as uh, the CitraSafe uh, company has done, then it's protected in the gut and it's actually absorbed better into the intestine, and it actually gets up to the brain in a form, the acetyl form, that actually is more easily and better uh, absorbed. So here we have our, our, our glutathione here, acetyl glutathione gets in the gut, and again, most um, unacetylated uh, forms are going to get broken down here, and they're not going to get absorbed. Here's a little picture of the gut, and it goes up to the uh, to the uh, brain and other organs, of course, in a higher uh, percentage, and it actually gets into there through the blood vessels to the astrocytes and to the neurons better uh, than the other forms, which is why this works and other other, other forms do not work. And uh, I apologize, I don't think this slide is working quite correctly. Basically, it has the acetylglutathione, has the resveratrol up here, and the nitrous oxide supplement uh, down here. They're all contributing to nourishing, the, in particular, the astrocytes and the, we call it the glia, and they support the nerve cells and help them repair. So, um, in, in, in summary, the concussion component here is, um, and, and what we're actually doing is we're setting up to do, uh, we have a, we've just started a pilot uh, program with uh, our NFL players, and we're going to be, we're get, we started to start the first one last week with the brain repair kit, the glutathione, was veritrol, and in this case, the uh, the pine bark, um, uh, as as well as uh, as well as the uh, glutathione balm. So we're going to start them on that. We're going to then, uh, in a short time, add on the uh, the Clear Mind um, 
uh, uh, neurofeedback, uh, and then we're also going to add on uh, uh, oxygen therapy. So we're going to kind of boom, 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 and see if we can get our guys uh, uh, improved. Much of the work that's being done with uh, the NFL players is trying to figure out what's the underlying pathophysiology and how do we detect it early, but this is actually a therapeutic trial. So we're going to do a focused pilot series, and then we'll probably expand that in the not too distant future to a larger, more formal study. So anyway, we're going to look at the brain repair kit, uh, the intracellular repair and operational aspect of it, and my experience has been with my workers' comp cases and with my um, personal injury cases and my, uh, my sports guys, the earlier institution the better. And then the question is, do we want to start these guys prophylactically on this? And of course, um, uh, Kurt's uh, nicely articulated uh, impression is, I've got patients that I, I'm treating with these things who will spontaneously ask me about their, their son's uh, APOE uh, status and can I get my son tested, uh, uh, you know, because football is big down here and, uh, and uh, teams are, are terrific, uh, but, you know, uh, they, they want to know what their, what their sons have and, uh, and daughters as well. So, and this pretty much holds true for any brain in insult, just as I think the crew today has, has delineated. So whether it's heat stroke, whether it's a concussion, whether it's inflammation from mold or other processes, any brain insult, operating and improving it in this fashion gives you your best uh, chance. And uh, this is a little uh, New York Times uh, thing because the brain is sort of uh, up front now. It says, uh, this is your brain. Um, and uh, they had a, not, some nice articles about that. So anyway, that's, um, that's my part of the talk. I'm, basically just kind of a guy in the trench here with uh, neurologic psychiatric issues and empirically looking for the best things that tend to work and this has been delightful because this and the mold cases have allowed me to delve into the functional medicine into the integrative medicine where there are things therapeutically that can be done plus you can look at uh, other aspects and you can marry the best of classical medicine and, um, and integrative functional medicine. So that's, that's, I guess, all I have to say, unless there's questions. Ben, back to you. Okay, great. So one of the questions we had was, uh, how long do you keep people on the supplements post-injury? Well, um, just like a medication, um, I titrate them up, keep them there for at least uh, six to uh, eight months, and then we can titrate them down and see if they have symptoms recurring. Uh, I think there's going to be some that recur, some didn't. If you remember one of our first ladies here who was the graphic artist, she was able to get down and off her supplements, uh, and as long as she kept her environment, environment clear, she did okay. My pro, pro football player um, as soon as he stops them, within five to seven days, he gets symptomatic. So I think he's going to be on them long term, maybe lifetime. Can you go over the titrate, the titration part of it, a little bit more detail? Yeah, I mean, since there's there's since there's not really much in the way of getting uh, side effects and getting patients on these uh, supplements or getting them off, it's uh, really fairly straightforward. You can start them out on all three. Uh, for instance, I used to start patients on one supplement, add another, and then add the third. But at this point, uh, since there's no side effects, uh, obviously you can start all three right off the bat. If you're titrating someone with medication, uh, obviously you got to start uh, low, increase a little bit, add a little time. And with the supplements, uh, if you want to see if they're still having, um, if the body's still benefiting from it or needs to stay on the on the supplements, then you basically just um, um, pull them off, and within a short time, I would say probably a week to two weeks, you probably find out that their symptoms are going to recur or they're not. And if they do recur, then just get them back on it and say, well, listen, just keep up. It's like a vitamin. Okay. Another question. Would you give the supplement uh, brain repair kit to someone if the injury was three to five years ago? Well, as, as, as with our uh, pro football player, here uh, he's 64. And his injuries were clear back um, when he was in his 20s and 30s. Yet he responded uh, to, to the supplements. Uh, so that tells me, I think, 
maybe it doesn't repair everything at this late date, but it helps it function, helps his brain function. So if you can give him the fuel to run on, maybe it's too late to repair what's been damaged, but uh, if you can get him to function better uh, by keeping him on the supplements, uh, terrific. So I, I would definitely give it a, a try. It's a real simple thing to do and can have tremendous benefit. Okay, great. And then, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. have you seen it helpful for brain enhancement? So I guess uh, optimization as opposed to damage. Have you done any any research with that? Maybe for your own brain, Larry. Well, yeah, I'm laughing because all of us, including everyone in this group, of course, will try this stuff. And uh, I like to be scientific about it, so I started the glutathione, and about three months later I started the resveratrol, and then I started the, uh, the beet powder. And I could tell a quantum uh, improvement in um, memory and my physical capabilities as well. And um, if I don't uh, take the supplements, I can see myself slide back a little bit. So uh, in the pre-pre-senile uh, status here, it certainly uh, has worked for me. So, I, and, it, and it may just be you're improving some of the aging process or what have you, uh, but it definitely made a difference. I don't, I don't think it may be any smarter than I was before I took the supplements, <laughs> but uh, maybe we could send some to our political candidates if we thought that would help. I don't know. Oh boy, there we go. Well, I, I think it's similar to some of the research we see with, with neurofeedback where the IQ can go up 5 to 15 points, the, uh, the ACT score can be 2 points higher, some of those things. It's not necessarily that we're smarter, it's can we process faster, can we, uh, can we take in what, what information's coming in, decipher it, get it out there, you know, and, and that's the big thing I see when I, when I take uh, any of these brain brain pop products that we've talked about today, uh, you know, at, along with oxygen therapy, along with neurofeedback, along with uh, you know, stabilizing my blood sugar, anything else, it's just things click a whole lot faster. Yeah, yeah exactly right. It's like being a teenager again, you think? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, Back when we were real quick and had a smart mouth. Yeah, I don't know if that was constructive or not, was it? Okay, well, Larry, thank you so much. I think everybody got a lot of really good information from you.